Welcome back, fellow economic enthusiasts and financial aficionados. It's your favorite host here, ready to dive deep into the murky waters of European economic policy and expose the true nature of this so-called inflation miracle. Buckle up, because we're about to embark on a wild ride through the treacherous landscape of monetary mismanagement and bureaucratic blunders. Let's start with the headline that's got everyone buzzing. Inflation in France and Spain plunged below 2%. Oh, how the Eurocrats must be patting themselves on the back. But hold your applause, ladies and gentlemen, because this achievement is nothing more than smoke and mirrors, a carefully crafted illusion designed to distract us from the true state of the European economy. First, let's take a closer look at these numbers. France's inflation rate dropped to 1.5%, while Spain's fell to 1.7%. On the surface, this might seem like cause for celebration. After all, isn't a 2% inflation rate the holy grail of central banking? But as always, the devil is in the details. The primary driver behind this sudden drop in inflation? Energy costs. That's right, folks. The same volatile commodity that sent inflation soaring last year is now responsible for its dramatic decline. But here's the kicker. Energy prices are notoriously fickle, subject to the whims of geopolitical tensions and supply chain disruptions. Are we really supposed to believe that this temporary reprieve in energy costs is a sign of sustainable economic stability? Let's not forget the broader context here. The European economy is teetering on the brink of recession. Germany, the supposed economic powerhouse of the continent, is facing rising unemployment and a contracting private sector. The latest data shows that German unemployment rose more than anticipated this month, signaling that the economic rough patch is having an increasing impact on the labor market. Is this really the time to be celebrating a temporary dip in inflation? But wait, there's more. The European Central Bank, ECB, has been engaging in a dangerous game of monetary chicken, raising interest rates at a breakneck pace in a desperate attempt to tame inflation. Now, with inflation seemingly under control, investors and economists are clamoring for rate cuts. It's like watching a group of children playing with matches in a room full of dynamite. Let's take a moment to examine the ECB's track record, shall we? This is the same institution that was caught flat-footed when inflation began to surge in 2021. They insisted it was transitory, remember? And now we're supposed to trust their judgment on when to cut rates? It's laughable. The truth is, the ECB is trapped in a prison of its own making. They've raised rates so aggressively that they've pushed the European economy to the brink of recession. Now, they're faced with an impossible choice. Continue to hold rates high and risk plunging the economy into a full-blown crisis or cut rates and potentially reignite inflationary pressures. But here's where it gets really interesting, folks. The ECB has already warned that price gains in the region will probably pick up again later this year. So, they're effectively admitting that this current low inflation environment is nothing more than a temporary blip. Yet, they're still considering rate cuts. It's economic malpractice of the highest order. Let's put some numbers to this madness, shall we? According to the latest ECB projections, inflation in the Eurozone is expected to average 5.6% in 2023, 3.2% in 2024, and 2.1% in 2025. That's right, they don't expect inflation to fully return to their 2% target until late 2025. So why on earth are we even discussing rate cuts now? but it gets even more absurd. The ECB's own survey shows that consumers expect prices to rise more slowly over the coming years. This is a classic case of the central bank falling victim to its own propaganda. They've managed to convince the public that inflation is under control, but at what cost? The reality is that the European economy is far from healthy. Economic growth in the Eurozone is anemic at best. The latest forecasts from the European Commission project GDP growth of just 0.8% in 2023 and 1.3% 1 in 2024. These are hardly the numbers of a robust, thriving economy. And let's not forget about the elephant in the room. Debt. Government debt in the Eurozone stood at a staggering 91.6% of GDP in the first quarter of 2023. That's an improvement from the COVID era peak. Sure, but it's still dangerously high. How are these countries supposed to service this mountain of debt if interest rates remain elevated? Now, some of you might be thinking, but what about the United States? Their inflation is coming down too. 
Ah uh, yes, the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation showed the smallest annual gain since early 2021. But let's not kid ourselves, the U.S. economy is in a very different position than Europe's. For one, the U.S. labor market remains remarkably resilient, with unemployment at historic lows. In contrast, unemployment in the Eurozone stood at 6.4% in August 2023. That's nearly double the U.S. rate. And while the U.S. economy grew at a robust 2.1% in the second quarter of 2023, the Eurozone economy expanded by a measly 0.1% in the same period. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the financial markets themselves. After the release of the latest inflation data, markets boosted bets on another quarter-point reduction in rates on October 17th, now pricing about an 80% chance of such a scenario. Major financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, BNP Paribas, and HSBC have all shifted their forecasts to predict a rate cut in October. What does this tell us? It tells us that the markets have zero confidence in the ECB's ability to navigate this economic minefield. They're essentially betting that the central bank will panic and cut rates at the first sign of economic trouble, regardless of the long-term inflationary consequences. And let's not forget about the euro itself. The common currency has been on a downward trajectory against the U.S. dollar, trading near its lowest levels in months. A weaker euro might provide some short-term boost to exports, but it also makes imports more expensive, potentially reigniting inflationary pressures. It's a vicious cycle that the ECB seems ill-equipped to break. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of this entire situation is the growing divergence between core inflation and headline inflation. While headline inflation has indeed fallen below 2% in France and Spain, core inflation, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, remains stubbornly high. In the Eurozone as a whole, core inflation stood at 5.3% in August 2023. That's more than double the ECB's target. This divergence highlights the fundamental weakness of the ECB's approach. They're focusing on headline numbers that can be easily swayed by temporary factors, while ignoring the underlying inflationary pressures that continue to build in the economy. It's like treating the symptoms of a disease while ignoring the root cause. And let's not forget about the potential for economic shocks on the horizon. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine continues to cast a shadow over European energy markets. Any escalation could send energy prices soaring once again, undoing all of the supposed progress on inflation in an instant. Are we really supposed to believe that the ECB has the tools and the foresight to navigate such a volatile environment? But wait, there's more. The ECB's obsession with inflation has led them to neglect other crucial aspects of economic policy. Take, for example, the growing wealth inequality in the Eurozone. According to a recent study by the European Central Bank itself, the wealthiest 10% of households in the Eurozone own 51% of total net wealth. Meanwhile, the bottom 50% own just 5%. How is cutting interest rates going to address this fundamental imbalance in the economy? And let's talk about productivity. The Eurozone has long struggled with sluggish productivity growth, a problem that has only been exacerbated by the pandemic and subsequent economic turmoil. According to data from the OECD, labor productivity growth in the Eurozone averaged just 0.8% per year between 2010 and 2019, compared to 1.1% in the United States. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this structural issue? The truth is, the ECB's monetary policy tools are woefully inadequate to address the complex challenges facing the European economy. They're like a doctor armed with only a hammer, desperately trying to perform brain surgery. It's not just ineffective, it's dangerous. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their own projections. According to their latest forecasts, the Eurozone economy is expected to grow by just 0.7% in 2023, 1% in 2024, and 1.5% 1 in 2025. These are not the growth rates of a healthy, vibrant economy. They're the anemic numbers of a region struggling to stay afloat. And yet, the ECB wants us to believe that they've got everything under control? It's laughable. Let's talk about the banking sector for a moment, shall we? The recent collapse of Credit Suisse and the ongoing troubles at Deutsche Bank have exposed the fragility of Europe's financial system. According to the European Banking Authority, the average non-performing loan ratio for EU banks stood at 1.8% in Q2 2023. While this is an improvement from previous years, it's still a ticking time bomb. Any significant economic shock could send this ratio skyrocketing, 
potentially triggering another banking crisis. And speaking of crises, let's not forget about the looming threat of climate change. The European Environment Agency estimates that economic losses from weather and climate-related extremes in the EU already amount to around 12 billion euros per year. How is the ECB's myopic focus on inflation going to address this existential threat to the European economy? But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the demographic time bomb that's ticking away in Europe. According to Eurostat, the old age dependency ratio in the EU is projected to increase from 32.5% in 2021 to 57.1% in 2100. That means for every person aged 65 or over, there will be less than two people of working age. How is the ECB's current monetary policy going to address this fundamental shift in the structure of European society? And let's not forget about the persistent north-south divide in the Eurozone. While countries like Germany and the Netherlands enjoy relatively low unemployment rates and strong public finances, southern European nations like Italy and Greece continue to struggle with high debt levels and sluggish growth. According to the latest Eurostat data, the unemployment rate in Greece stood at 11.4% in July 2023, compared to just 3% in Germany. How is a one-size-fits-all monetary policy supposed to address these stark regional disparities? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the realm of innovation and technology. According to the European Innovation Scoreboard 2023, the EU continues to lag behind global competitors like the United States and South Korea in terms of innovation performance. How is manipulating interest rates going to bridge this innovation gap and ensure Europe's competitiveness in the 21st century global economy? Let's talk about the ECB's balance sheet for a moment. As of September 2023, the ECB's balance sheet stood at a staggering 7.8 trillion euros. That's more than 60% of the Eurozone's GDP. The central bank has become a behemoth, distorting financial markets and creating dangerous dependencies. And now they want to start cutting rates? It's like trying to land a jumbo jet on a postage stamp. It's not going to end well. And let's not forget about the political dimension of all this. The rise of populist and eurosceptic parties across the continent is a direct result of the economic mismanagement of the past decade. According to a recent Eurobarometer survey, only 49% of EU citizens trust the European Central Bank. That's a damning indictment of an institution that's supposed to be the guardian of economic stability in the Eurozone. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of this whole situation is the growing divergence between financial markets and the real economy. While stock markets in Europe have been rallying on the prospect of rate cuts, the real economy continues to struggle. The Eurostox 50 index is up over 10% year-to-date as of September 2023, while real wages in the Eurozone have been stagnant or declining for many workers. This disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street is a recipe for social unrest and economic instability. And let's talk about the Euro itself for a moment. The common currency was supposed to be a symbol of European unity and economic strength. Instead, it's become a straitjacket, preventing individual countries from adjusting their monetary policies to suit their specific economic needs. According to a study by the Center for European Reform, the euro has cost the average Italian citizen 74,000 euros in lost GDP growth since its introduction. Is it any wonder that Euroscepticism is on the rise? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's communication strategy, or lack thereof. The central bank's forward guidance has been about as clear as mud. One day they're talking about the need for continued vigilance against inflation, the next they're hinting at rate cuts. It's like trying to read tea leaves in a hurricane. How are businesses and consumers supposed to make long-term economic decisions in this environment of uncertainty? And let's not forget about the ECB's asset purchase programs. The central bank has been buying up government bonds like they're going out of style. As of August 2023, the ECB held over 3.2 trillion euros in government bonds through its various purchase programs. This has effectively turned the central bank into the lender of last resort for profligate governments. How is this fostering fiscal discipline and economic responsibility? But perhaps the most egregious aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on savers and pensioners. With interest rates at rock-bottom levels for years, savers have been effectively punished for their prudence. According to a study by DZ Bank, German savers have lost over 700 billion euros in interest income since 2010 due to the ECB's low interest rate policy. Is it any wonder that consumer confidence in the Eurozone remains depressed? 
and let's talk about the housing market for a moment. The ECB's loose monetary policy has fueled a housing bubble in many European cities. According to the latest data from Eurostat, house prices in the EU increased by 7.9% in Q2 2023 compared to the same quarter of the previous year. This is making homeownership increasingly unaffordable for many Europeans, exacerbating wealth inequality and social tensions. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's climate change strategy, or lack thereof. While other central banks around the world are actively incorporating climate risks into their monetary policy frameworks, the ECB has been dragging its feet. According to a report by Positive Money, the ECB's corporate bond purchases are still skewed towards carbon-intensive sectors. How is this helping to transition the European economy towards a sustainable future? And let's not forget about the ongoing saga of Target 2 balances. These intra-euro system claims have ballooned to astronomical levels, with Germany's Target 2 surplus reaching over 1.2 trillion euros as of August 2023. This is a symptom of the fundamental imbalances within the eurozone and a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the realm of productivity and competitiveness. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report 2022, only three Eurozone countries, Netherlands, Germany, and Finland, rank in the top 10 most competitive economies globally. How is the ECB's myopic focus on inflation going to address this fundamental weakness in the European economic model? And let's talk about the digital euro for a moment. The ECB is plowing ahead with plans for a central bank digital currency, but without a clear understanding of the potential risks and implications. According to a survey by the European Banking Federation, 62% of European banks believe that a digital euro could lead to deposit outflows and increased financial instability. Is this really the time to be experimenting with the very foundations of our monetary system? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's approach to financial stability. The central bank's stress tests of European banks have been criticized for being too lenient and failing to capture real-world risks. According to a report by Finance Watch, the ECB stress tests do not adequately account for climate-related financial risks. How can we trust the stability of the European financial system when its guardian is wearing rose-tinted glasses? And let's not forget about the persistent problem of non-performing loans in the European banking sector. While the overall NPL ratio has improved in recent years, it remains a significant issue in some countries. According to the latest data from the European Banking Authority, the NPL ratio in Greece stood at 8.5% in Q2 2023, compared to the EU average of 1.8%. This is a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment, potentially triggering another banking crisis. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on income inequality. According to a study by the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin, the ECB's quantitative easing program has disproportionately benefited the wealthy. The DIW Berlin study found that the top 10% of households by net wealth saw their assets grow by an average of €101,000 due to the ECB's quantitative easing program, while the bottom 20% saw an increase of just €2,600. This is exacerbating social tensions and undermining the very fabric of European society. Is this really the outcome we want from our central bank? But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the ECB's obsession with its inflation target. They've been so focused on hitting that magical 2% number that they've lost sight of the bigger picture. According to a study by the Center for Economic Policy Research, this narrow focus on inflation targeting has led to suboptimal outcomes in terms of economic growth and employment. It's like trying to steer a ship by looking only at the compass and ignoring the iceberg dead ahead. And let's not forget about the ECB's impact on the pension systems across Europe. With interest rates at rock-bottom levels for years, pension funds have struggled to generate returns. According to a report by Insurance Europe, the persistently low interest rate environment has increased the liabilities of European insurers and pension funds by an estimated 440 billion euros. Who's going to foot the bill for this shortfall? You guessed it, the average European taxpayer. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the realm of productivity growth. According to data from the OECD, Labor productivity growth in the Eurozone has been anemic, averaging just 0.8% per year between 2010 and 2019. This is well below the rate seen in other advanced economies like the United States. 
How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? And let's talk about the ECB's forward guidance for a moment. It's been about as clear as mud. One day they're talking about the need for continued vigilance against inflation, the next they're hinting at rate cuts. According to a study by the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, this inconsistent communication has led to increased market volatility and uncertainty. It's like trying to play chess with a toddler. You never know what move they're going to make next. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's approach to climate change. While other central banks around the world are actively incorporating climate risks into their monetary policy frameworks, the ECB has been dragging its feet. According to a report by the Network for Greening the Financial System, the ECB lags behind its peers in terms of integrating climate considerations into its operations. How is this helping to transition the European economy towards a sustainable future? And let's not forget about the ongoing debate about fiscal policy in the Eurozone. The ECB has repeatedly called for more fiscal support from governments, but the bloc's fiscal rules remain a straitjacket. According to a report by the European Fiscal Board, the current fiscal framework is overly complex and procyclical, hampering effective economic management. How is monetary policy supposed to be effective when fiscal policy is stuck in the dark ages? But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on financial stability. The central bank's loose monetary policy has fueled asset bubbles across the continent. According to data from the Bank for International Settlements, the credit-to-GDP gap, a key indicator of financial stability risks, has been widening in several Eurozone countries. Are we setting ourselves up for another financial crisis? And let's talk about the Euro for a moment. The common currency was supposed to bring economic convergence and stability to the bloc. Instead, it's exacerbated economic divergences. According to a study by the Center for European Reform, the euro has cost the average Italian citizen 74,000 euros in lost GDP growth since its introduction. Is it any wonder that euroscepticism is on the rise? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's digital euro project. While the central bank touts it as the future of money, many experts are skeptical. According to a survey by the European Banking Federation, 62% of European banks believe that a digital euro could lead to deposit outflows and increased financial instability. Are we really ready to experiment with the very foundations of our monetary system? And let's not forget about the persistent problem of zombie firms in the eurozone. These are companies that should have gone bankrupt but are being kept alive by low interest rates and forbearance. According to a study by the Bank for International Settlements, up to 15% of companies in some eurozone countries could be classified as zombies. How is this fostering innovation and economic dynamism? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the realm of income inequality. According to data from Eurostat, income inequality in the Eurozone, as measured by the Gini coefficient, has been on the rise since the financial crisis. The ECB's policies have disproportionately benefited asset owners, exacerbating this trend. Is this really the kind of society we want to create? And let's talk about the ECB's balance sheet for a moment. It's ballooned to astronomical levels, reaching over 7 trillion euros. According to a report by the German Institute for Economic Research, this massive expansion of the central bank's balance sheet poses significant risks to financial stability. What happens when it's time to unwind all these asset purchases? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's approach to bank supervision. While the creation of the single supervisory mechanism was a step in the right direction, problems persist. According to a report by the European Court of Auditors, there are still significant gaps in the ECB's supervision of systemic risks in the banking sector. Are we really prepared for the next banking crisis? And let's not forget about the ongoing debate about the ECB's mandate. While some argue for an expansion to include objectives like full employment or climate change mitigation, Others insist on maintaining a narrow focus on price stability. According to a survey by the Center for Economic Policy Research, there's no consensus among economists on this issue. How can we expect coherent policy when there's no agreement on what the ECB should be doing? But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on democratic accountability. The central bank has become increasingly powerful making decisions that affect the lives of millions of Europeans with little democratic oversight. According to a study by Transparency International EU, the ECB lacks sufficient transparency and accountability mechanisms. 
is this really compatible with European democratic values? And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial innovation for a moment. While the central bank has been cautious about cryptocurrencies and other fintech developments, it risks being left behind. According to a report by the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, the ECB needs to do more to foster financial innovation while managing risks. Are we risking Europe's future competitiveness in the global financial system? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European banking sector. Years of low interest rates have squeezed bank profitability, leading to consolidation and job cuts. According to data from the European Banking Federation, the number of credit institutions in the EU has fallen by over 30% since 2008. Is this really creating a more resilient and competitive banking sector? And let's not forget about the persistent problem of capital flight within the Eurozone. During times of crisis, we've seen massive outflows from peripheral countries to core countries, exacerbating economic divergences. According to data from the ECB, target two imbalances, a proxy for capital flows, have reached record levels. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from the realm of long-term economic growth. According to projections from the European Commission, potential growth in the Eurozone is expected to remain below 1.5% for the foreseeable future. This is well below the rates seen in other advanced economies. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? And let's talk about the ECB's impact on the housing market for a moment. Years of low interest rates have fueled housing bubbles in many European cities, making homeownership increasingly unaffordable for many. According to data from Eurostat, house prices in the EU have increased by over 40% since 2010. Is this really creating a stable and equitable economic environment? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's approach to financial market functioning. While the central bank's interventions have helped to stabilize markets during crises, they've also created dangerous dependencies. According to a report by the Bank for International Settlements, there's a risk that financial markets have become overly reliant on central bank support. What happens when the ECB tries to normalize policy? And let's not forget about the ongoing debate about the international role of the euro. Despite efforts to promote the euro as a global reserve currency, it still lags far behind the US dollar. According to data from the International Monetary Fund, the euro accounts for only about 20% of global foreign exchange reserves, compared to nearly 60% for the US dollar. This weakness in the euro's international role limits Europe's global economic influence and exposes the continent to external shocks. Is this really the outcome we expected when we launched the common currency? But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the ECB's impact on the European labor market. While the central bank's policies have helped to reduce unemployment in some countries, they've also contributed to the rise of precarious work and the gig economy. According to a report by the European Trade Union Institute, nearly 40% of workers in the EU are in some form of atypical employment. Is this really the kind of labor market we want to create? And let's not forget about the ECB's role in perpetuating the Eurozone's structural imbalances. The single monetary policy has exacerbated the competitiveness gap between core and peripheral countries. According to data from Eurostat, the current account surplus of Germany reached a staggering 7.4% of GDP in 2022, while countries like Greece and Portugal continue to struggle with deficits. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability within the bloc? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on innovation and productivity growth. According to the European Innovation Scoreboard 2023, the EU continues to lag behind global competitors like the United States and South Korea in terms of innovation performance. How is manipulating interest rates going to bridge this innovation gap and ensure Europe's competitiveness in the 21st century global economy? And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial regulation for a moment. While the central bank has implemented stricter capital requirements for banks, it's been slow to address emerging risks in the shadow banking sector. According to a report by the European Systemic Risk Board, non-bank financial intermediation now accounts for nearly 40% of the EU financial system. Are we setting ourselves up for another financial crisis? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on pension systems across Europe. Years of low interest rates have put enormous pressure on pension funds, 
forcing them to take on more risk to meet their obligations. According to a study by Insurance Europe, the persistently low interest rate environment has increased the liabilities of European insurers and pension funds by an estimated 440 billion euros. Who's going to foot the bill for this shortfall? And let's not forget about the ECB's role in exacerbating wealth inequality. The central bank's asset purchase programs have disproportionately benefited the wealthy, who own the majority of financial assets. According to a study by the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin, the ECB's quantitative easing program has increased wealth inequality in Germany by 0.5 Gini points. Is this really the kind of society we want to create? But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on fiscal discipline within the Eurozone. By keeping borrowing costs artificially low, the central bank has enabled governments to delay necessary structural reforms and fiscal consolidation. According to data from Eurostat, government debt in the Eurozone reached a staggering 95.6% of GDP in 2022. How is this fostering long-term economic sustainability? And let's talk about the ECB's approach to climate change for a moment. While the central bank has finally acknowledged the importance of climate risks, its actions have been woefully inadequate. According to a report by Positive Money, the ECB's corporate bond purchases are still skewed towards carbon-intensive sectors. How is this helping to transition the European economy towards a sustainable future? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European banking sector. Years of low interest rates have squeezed bank profitability, leading to consolidation and job cuts. According to data from the European Banking Authority, the return on equity for EU banks stood at just 7.2% in Q2 2023, well below the cost of capital for many institutions. Is this really creating a more resilient and competitive banking sector? And let's not forget about the ongoing saga of non-performing loans in the European banking sector. While the overall NPL ratio has improved in recent years, it remains a significant issue in some countries. According to the latest data from the European Banking Authority, the NPL ratio in Greece stood at 8.5% in Q2 2023, compared to the EU average of 1.8%. This is a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment, potentially triggering another banking crisis. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on democratic accountability. The central bank has become increasingly powerful, making decisions that affect the lives of millions of Europeans with little democratic oversight. According to a study by Transparency International EU, the ECB lacks sufficient transparency and accountability mechanisms. Is this really compatible with European democratic values? And let's talk about the ECB's Digital Euro Project for a moment. While the central bank touts it as the future of money, many experts are skeptical. According to a survey by the European Banking Federation, 62% of European banks believe that a digital euro could lead to deposit outflows and increased financial instability. Are we really ready to experiment with the very foundations of our monetary system? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European corporate sector. Years of low interest rates have enabled the survival of so-called zombie firms, companies that should have gone bankrupt but are being kept alive by cheap credit. According to a study by the Bank for International Settlements, up to 15% of companies in some Eurozone countries could be classified as zombies. How is this fostering innovation and economic dynamism? And let's not forget about the ECB's role in perpetuating the Eurozone's structural imbalances. The single monetary policy has exacerbated the competitiveness gap between core and peripheral countries. According to data from Eurostat, unit labor costs in southern European countries have increased much faster than in Germany since the introduction of the euro. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability within the bloc? But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on long-term economic growth prospects. According to projections from the European Commission, potential growth in the eurozone is expected to remain below 1.5% for the foreseeable future. This is well below the rates seen in other advanced economies. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial market functioning for a moment. While the central bank's interventions have helped to stabilize markets during crises, they've also created dangerous dependencies. According to a report by the Bank for International Settlements, there's a risk that financial markets have become overly reliant on central bank support 
What happens when the ECB tries to normalize policy? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European sovereign bond market. The central bank's massive bond buying programs have distorted market pricing and created artificial demand for government debt. According to data from the ECB, the central bank now owns over 30% of eligible Eurozone government bonds. How is this fostering market discipline and fiscal responsibility? And let's not forget about the ongoing debate about the ECB's mandate. While some argue for an expansion to include objectives like full employment or climate change mitigation, others insist on maintaining a narrow focus on price stability. According to a survey by the Center for Economic Policy Research, there's no consensus among economists on this issue. How can we expect coherent policy when there's no agreement on what the ECB should be doing? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on intergenerational equity. Years of low interest rates have penalized savers and rewarded borrowers, effectively transferring wealth from older generations to younger ones. According to a study by the German Bundesbank, German households have lost over 700 billion euros in interest income since 2010 due to the ECB's low interest rate policy. Is this really the kind of intergenerational compact we want to create? And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial innovation for a moment. While the central bank has been cautious about cryptocurrencies and other fintech developments, it risks being left behind. According to a report by the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, the ECB needs to do more to foster financial innovation while managing risks. Are we risking Europe's future competitiveness in the global financial system? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European real estate market. Years of low interest rates have fueled housing bubbles in many European cities, making home ownership increasingly unaffordable for many. According to data from Eurostat, house prices in the EU have increased by over 40% since 2010. Is this really creating a stable and equitable housing market? The answer is a resounding no. These inflated housing prices are not only making it difficult for young Europeans to get on the property ladder, but are also increasing the risk of a devastating housing market crash. It's like the ECB is inflating a balloon, completely oblivious to the fact that it might pop at any moment. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the ECB's impact on the European pension system. With interest rates at rock-bottom levels for years, pension funds have been struggling to generate the returns needed to meet their obligations. According to a report by the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, EIOPA, the share of European pension funds with funding ratios below 100% increased from 25% in 2019 to 33% in 2020. This means that a third of European pension funds don't have enough assets to cover their liabilities. Who's going to foot the bill for this shortfall? You guessed it, the average European taxpayer. And let's not forget about the ECB's role in perpetuating the Eurozone's structural imbalances. The one-size-fits-all monetary policy has been a disaster for countries with different economic structures and cycles. According to a study by the Center for European Reform, the euro has cost the average Italian citizen 74,000 euros in lost GDP growth since its introduction. Meanwhile, Germany has reaped the benefits of an artificially weak currency, boosting its exports and accumulating massive current account surpluses. Is this really the kind of economic union we envisioned? But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on productivity growth. According to data from the OECD, labor productivity growth in the Eurozone has been anemic, averaging just 0.8% per year between 2010 and 2019. This is well below the rate seen in other advanced economies like the United States. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? It's like trying to fix a broken leg with a band-aid. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial stability for a moment. The central bank's stress tests of European banks have been criticized for being too lenient and failing to capture real-world risks. According to a report by Finance Watch, the ECB stress tests do not adequately account for climate-related financial risks. How can we trust the stability of the European financial system when its guardian is wearing rose-tinted glasses? But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on income inequality. The central bank's policies have disproportionately benefited asset owners, exacerbating wealth disparities. According to a study by the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin, 
The ECB's quantitative easing program has increased wealth inequality in Germany by 0.5 genie points. Is this really the kind of society we want to create? It's like the ECB is playing Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor to give to the rich. And let's not forget about the ongoing saga of Target 2 balances. These intra-euro system claims have ballooned to astronomical levels, with Germany's Target 2 surplus reaching over 1.2 trillion euros as of August 2023. This is a symptom of the fundamental imbalances within the eurozone and a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment. It's like the ECB is sitting on a powder keg, casually lighting matches. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on democratic accountability. The central bank has become increasingly powerful, making decisions that affect the lives of millions of Europeans with little democratic oversight. According to a study by Transparency International EU, the ECB lacks sufficient transparency and accountability mechanisms. Is this really compatible with European democratic values? It's like we've created an economic leviathan with no checks and balances. And let's talk about the ECB's digital euro project for a moment. While the central bank touts it as the future of money, many experts are skeptical. According to a survey by the European Banking Federation, 62% of European banks believe that a digital euro could lead to deposit outflows and increased financial instability. Are we really ready to experiment with the very foundations of our monetary system? It's like the ECB is playing mad scientist with our economy. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European corporate sector. Years of low interest rates have enabled the survival of so-called zombie firms, companies that should have gone bankrupt but are being kept alive by cheap credit. According to a study by the Bank for International Settlements, up to 15% of companies in some Eurozone countries could be classified as zombies. How is this fostering innovation and economic dynamism? It's like the ECB is creating an army of economic undead. And let's not forget about the ECB's role in exacerbating the Eurozone's competitiveness gap. The single monetary policy has made it difficult for less competitive countries to regain their economic footing. According to data from Eurostat, the productivity gap between Northern and Southern European countries has widened since the introduction of the Euro. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability within the bloc? It's like the ECB is running a race where some countries are given a head start while others are forced to run with lead weights. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on long-term economic growth prospects. According to projections from the European Commission, potential growth in the Eurozone is expected to remain below 1.5% for the foreseeable future. This is well below the rates seen in other advanced economies. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? It's like trying to jumpstart a car with a dead battery using a feather. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to climate change for a moment. While the central bank has finally acknowledged the importance of climate risks, its actions have been woefully inadequate. According to a report by Positive Money, the ECB's corporate bond purchases are still skewed towards carbon-intensive sectors. How is this helping to transition the European economy towards a sustainable future? It's like the ECB is trying to put out a forest fire with a water pistol. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European banking sector. Years of low interest rates have squeezed bank profitability, leading to consolidation and job cuts. According to data from the European Banking Authority, the return on equity for EU banks stood at just 7.2% in Q2 2023, well below the cost of capital for many institutions. Is this really creating a more resilient and competitive banking sector? It's like the ECB is on a mission to turn our banks into financial zombies. And let's not forget about the persistent problem of non-performing loans in the European banking sector. While the overall NPL ratio has improved in recent years, it remains a significant issue in some countries. According to the latest data from the European Banking Authority, the NPL ratio in Greece stood at 8.5% in Q2 2023, compared to the EU average of 1.8%. This is a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment, potentially triggering another banking crisis. It's like the ECB is playing financial Jenga, hoping the tower doesn't collapse. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on intergenerational equity. Years of low interest rates have penalized savers and rewarded borrowers, effectively transferring wealth from older generations to younger ones. 
According to a study by the German Bundesbank, German households have lost over 700 billion euros in interest income since 2010 due to the ECB's low interest rate policy. Is this really the kind of intergenerational compact we want to create? It's like the ECB is running a massive Ponzi scheme, but instead of new investors, it's relying on future generations. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial innovation for a moment. While the central bank has been cautious about cryptocurrencies and other fintech developments, it risks being left behind. According to a report by the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, the ECB needs to do more to foster financial innovation while managing risks. Are we risking Europe's future competitiveness in the global financial system? It's like the ECB is stuck in the Stone Age while the rest of the world is entering the digital era. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European sovereign bond market. The central bank's massive bond buying programs have distorted market pricing and created artificial demand for government debt. According to data from the ECB, the central bank now owns over 30% of eligible Eurozone government bonds. How is this fostering market discipline and fiscal responsibility? It's like the ECB is enabling a continent-wide addiction to debt. And let's not forget about the ongoing debate about the ECB's mandate. While some argue for an expansion to include objectives like full employment or climate change mitigation, others insist on maintaining a narrow focus on price stability. According to a survey by the Center for Economic Policy Research, there's no consensus among economists on this issue. How can we expect coherent policy when there's no agreement on what the ECB should be doing? It's like asking a chef to prepare a gourmet meal without telling them what ingredients they can use or what dish they're supposed to make. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the ECB's impact on the European labor market. While the central bank's policies have helped to reduce unemployment in some countries, they've also contributed to the rise of precarious work and the gig economy. According to a report by the European Trade Union Institute, nearly 40% of workers in the EU are in some form of atypical employment. Is this really the kind of labor market we want to create? It's like the ECB is turning Europe into a continent of part-time workers and zero-hour contracts. And let's not forget about the ECB's role in perpetuating the Eurozone's structural imbalances. The single monetary policy has exacerbated the competitiveness gap between core and peripheral countries. According to data from Eurostat, the current account surplus of Germany reached a staggering 7.4% of GDP in 2022, while countries like Greece and Portugal continue to struggle with deficits. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability within the bloc? It's like the ECB is running a rigged game where some countries always win and others always lose. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on innovation and productivity growth. According to the European Innovation Scoreboard 2023, the EU continues to lag behind global competitors like the United States and South Korea in terms of innovation performance. How is manipulating interest rates going to bridge this innovation gap and ensure Europe's competitiveness in the 21st century global economy? It's like trying to win a Formula One race with a horse and cart. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial regulation for a moment. While the central bank has implemented stricter capital requirements for banks, it's been slow to address emerging risks in the shadow banking sector. According to a report by the European Systemic Risk Board, non-bank financial intermediation now accounts for nearly 40% of the EU financial system. Are we setting ourselves up for another financial crisis? It's like the ECB is playing whack-a-mole with financial risks, always one step behind. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on pension systems across Europe. Years of low interest rates have put enormous pressure on pension funds, forcing them to take on more risk to meet their obligations. According to a study by Insurance Europe, the persistently low interest rate environment has increased the liabilities of European insurers and pension funds by an estimated 440 billion euros. Who's going to foot the bill for this shortfall? It's like the ECB is stealing from our future retirees to pay for today's economic growth. And let's not forget about the ECB's role in exacerbating wealth inequality. The central bank's asset purchase programs have disproportionately benefited the wealthy, who own the majority of financial assets. According to a study by the German Institute for Economic Research, DIW Berlin, the ECB's quantitative easing program has increased wealth inequality in Germany by 0.5 genie points. Is this really the kind of society we want to create? It's like the ECB is running a modern-day feudal system, 
with a small class of acid-owning lords and a vast sea of economic serfs. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on fiscal discipline within the Eurozone. By keeping borrowing costs artificially low, the central bank has enabled governments to delay necessary structural reforms and fiscal consolidation. According to data from Eurostat, government debt in the Eurozone reached a staggering 95.6% of GDP in 2022. How is this fostering long-term economic sustainability? It's like the ECB is encouraging governments to max out their credit cards with no plan to pay off the debt. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to climate change for a moment. While the central bank has finally acknowledged the importance of climate risks, its actions have been woefully inadequate. According to a report by Positive Money, the ECB's corporate bond purchases are still skewed towards carbon-intensive sectors. How is this helping to transition the European economy towards a sustainable future? It's like the ECB is trying to fight climate change by investing in coal mines. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European banking sector. Years of low interest rates have squeezed bank profitability, leading to consolidation and job cuts. According to data from the European Banking Authority, the return on equity for EU banks stood at just 7.2% in Q2 2023, well below the cost of capital for many institutions. Is this really creating a more resilient and competitive banking sector? It's like the ECB is slowly suffocating the very institutions it's supposed to be supporting. And let's not forget about the ongoing saga of non-performing loans in the European banking sector. While the overall NPL ratio has improved in recent years, it remains a significant issue in some countries. According to the latest data from the European Banking Authority, the NPL ratio in Greece stood at 8.5% in Q2 2023, compared to the EU average of 1.8%. This is a ticking time bomb that could explode at any moment, potentially triggering another banking crisis. It's like the ECB is playing Russian roulette with the European financial system. But perhaps the most damning indictment of the ECB's policies comes from their impact on democratic accountability. The central bank has become increasingly powerful, making decisions that affect the lives of millions of Europeans with little democratic oversight. According to a study by Transparency International EU, the ECB lacks sufficient transparency and accountability mechanisms. Is this really compatible with European democratic values? It's like we've created an economic Frankenstein's monster that's now beyond our control. And let's talk about the ECB's digital euro project for a moment. While the central bank touts it as the future of money, many experts are skeptical. According to a survey by the European Banking Federation, 62% of European banks believe that a digital euro could lead to deposit outflows and increased financial instability. Are we really ready to experiment with the very foundations of our monetary system? It's like the ECB is playing mad scientist with our entire economic infrastructure. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European corporate sector. Years of low interest rates have enabled the survival of so-called zombie firms, companies that should have gone bankrupt but are being kept alive by cheap credit. According to a study by the Bank for International Settlements, up to 15% of companies in some Eurozone countries could be classified as zombies. How is this fostering innovation and economic dynamism? It's like the ECB is creating an economy of the living dead. And let's not forget about the ECB's role in perpetuating the Eurozone's structural imbalances. The single monetary policy has exacerbated the competitiveness gap between core and peripheral countries. According to data from Eurostat, Unit labor costs in southern European countries have increased much faster than in Germany since the introduction of the euro. How is this fostering economic convergence and stability within the bloc? It's like the ECB is running a race where some countries are forced to wear lead shoes. But perhaps the most concerning aspect of the ECB's policies is their impact on long-term economic growth prospects. According to projections from the European Commission, Potential growth in the Eurozone is expected to remain below 1.5% for the foreseeable future. This is well below the rates seen in other advanced economies. How is manipulating interest rates going to solve this fundamental problem of economic stagnation? It's like trying to cure a patient's cancer with aspirin. And let's talk about the ECB's approach to financial market functioning for a moment. While the central bank's interventions have helped to stabilize markets during crises, they've also created dangerous dependencies. According to a report by the Bank for International Settlements, 
there's a risk that financial markets have become overly reliant on central bank support. What happens when the ECB tries to normalize policy? It's like we've created a generation of financial addicts dependent on the ECB's monetary methadone. But wait, there's more. Let's discuss the ECB's impact on the European sovereign bond market. The central bank's massive bond buying programs have distorted market pricing and created artificial demand for government debt. According to data from the ECB, the central bank now owns over 30% of eligible Eurozone government bonds. How is this fostering market discipline and fiscal responsibility? It's like the ECB is running a Ponzi scheme with government debt.